good afternoon, everybody. Today, I would like to start telling you a story about my mother. A few years ago, she was diagnosed with pre-melanoma. She was treated, everything was okay. But this is not only my mother's story. This is actually the story of about 13.2 million British citizens. Of these, 380,000 people are put on waiting lists and they have to wait 18 weeks to get their first specialist appointment. These numbers seem to me rather large, but when I understood there's only 659 dermatologists in the NHS England, then they make sense. So today we are here to present you with an alternative reality. We want to help you build your own AI dermatologist, one that you can have anywhere, anytime, and that at your fingerprints. You may be thinking that's quite impossible. And we are here to say, no, it's not actually. AI nowadays is allowing us to do, to achieve unthinkable things. A clear example of that, as I'm sure most of you know, is actually AlphaFold. AlphaFold has allowed the equivalent of 400 million years of research to be done in just a few weeks. And with this, the research done with AlphaFold has allowed the development of molecular syringes, for instance, that are able to now uh, enable treatment for gene therapy, cancer treatment, and even treat also malaria. Apart from that, the, the scientists of AlphaFold are also designing uh, plastic uh, digesting enzymes. So the challenge today is let's have our own AlphaFold moment. Let's build your own AI dermatologist doctor. So step one, data. And I'm sure you know AI models are data starving. So we want to make sure that we give it plenty of data but because we are working on skincare and dermatology, we do not want our model to be unbiased. We want it to be fair and we want to be, have representative of skin tones of, from everywhere. So we have to make sure data quality is good. We have to make sure we are doing the right thing and having unbiased and fair models. Secondly, because we are also working on these medical diagnostic cases, we have to make sure our data set has a representation of the pathology that we are looking for. We have to make sure the data contains the, so the solution to our problem. And here I'm presenting a few common skin care problems and I'm using acne as an example because it's a very common disease. So data set representative is a very important thing in skin care and also quality of data and having representative of the pathology we are looking for. Step two, the, uh, two. <laughs> and this is, there's a joke on it. So this is the training part and I'm not talking about squatting and bench pressing. I'm actually talking about, <laughs> I'm actually talking about training our AI model. To train our AI model, I have here a very basic explanation of something we AI uh, and technicians love to think about, which is cats and dogs. So we give it plenty of images of cats and plenty of images and of dogs to our AI model. Internally, it will update the weights and it will learn how to predict cat and dog. This is exactly the same as we are going to do for our AI student. We want to teach our student to predict images that have acne from images that do not have acne. And because, again, we are on healthcare space, we want to make sure that we are accurate and we have low false negative rates. If we do this, if we train our model very well, we can then support medical diagnosis. And we can then take a step further. For instance, on the acne problem, we can think about, instead of only predicting acne and non-acne, we can try to predict severity. So we can try to predict, use fine-tuning strategies to teach our AI student that's now becoming, becoming an AI doctor to predict between grade one or grade four of acne. We can also, if we look at it from a cosmetics perspective, we can also uh, teach it that when we see skin condition A and we pair it with treatment B, we get output C. So we can also do predictive analysis with these type of models. And by doing so, we have special, specialized models for as many conditions as we want. Step three, 
And just like an, a graduate student, a doctor, uh, our AI model needs a place to work. It can be the hospital. Deployment just means that our AI model will be available to us at the hospital, for instance, at the clinical practice, or even at your smartphones. So we want to make sure our AI model has a space to work. And just like a real doctor needs an office, our AI model will need infrastructure. And that relates to the use of CPUs, GPUs, and internet, for instance. Also, similarly to real doctors, when they need to get updated information, they go to medical conferences or, or they read a couple of papers, our models will also have to be updated from time to time. There's also, for instance, a new disease comes along, just like COVID, we have to update our models to be able to address new pathologies or new conditions. Thirdly, because doctors also use second opinions, our AI model will never try to do diagnostics on its own. So we want these models, when implemented in healthcare, when they are in doubt of something, when they are not sure, to go and ask the humans for support. So these are the three key aspects of deployment. And if we do that, we have this possibility for supported medical classification. We are also able to reduce uh, uh, subjectivity because machines don't get tired, the humans sometimes do. And then we also have scalability. So humans need to sleep and eat and they get tired, machines don't. We can scale these models very, very much and we can then uh, leverage these into our environment. Of course, no man is an island and we never want our AI model to be working alone on the healthcare space. And we also do not want humans having carrying all the burden and lifting all the heavy lift when we have effective tools that can support them in their job. So we are here presenting a solution to augment and never to replace humans. A clear example of that, that I've discussed also today, is screening events. And in the past, I've been involved in the screen, in screening of retinopathy. So uh, this is a very, uh, a very close to my uh, background project. But so for screening in, uh, in England, there's 460,000 suspected skin cancer occurrences yearly. And of these, only 6% are positive. This is great for the people that do not get positive diagnosis, right? But on the other hand, there's 94% of these images and cases that have to be looked by doctors. So using as reference the 50% reduction we saw before with the retinopathy screening, we can see that our original numbers of 380,000 people and 18 weeks of uh, waiting list are reduced to half, meaning nine weeks of, uh, of waiting time. And then from uh, half of those people, then just they get their diagnosis in just a few seconds. So this can uh, relate to many of you that so we worry for sometimes that we are, is it okay or is it not okay? We can get that output in just a few seconds. To conclude, I want to broaden the discussion a bit and still use this analogy. So the AI healthcare is massive. We have just discussed one problem and one model, but we can have our AI doctors in medic going to many medical schools. We can teach acne, we can teach uh, cancer, we can teach, we, we, we should make sure that we are using these as a support and not as independent solutions. Secondly, we can also put them into admin school. There's a lot of administration burden in healthcare. There's a lot of electronic records. So we can also use, explore this type of approach in admin. Efficiency is an example as the screening exam, as the screening a case that we discussed, and language school, Leticia will explain this in a bit. Thank you so much.